Hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories everywhere. Today we're listening to Dirty Chicken and Rice by Simon Roberts. Dirty Chicken and Rice, written and read by Simon Roberts. It's a dirty chicken and rice night. Has to be. Apart from what's happened to Spence, it's a Monday. Dell's at the cheapo supermarket buying chicken, basmati we already have, plus chilli flakes, cumin seeds, fennel seeds and coriander seeds. Reminds me, we need fresh coriander too. I text Dell, check the fridge, another text. Me. And yoghurt. Him. Anything else? Eye of newt, toe of frog. Me. Yeah, wool of bat. Too much quoting from the Scottish play? We don't need any more shit luck. Dell, of course, doesn't believe in all that. We conform pitifully to type. He's a cynical journalist, I'm a paranoid actor, and we've sunk most of a litre of Spanish red. I'm about to text again when Ali calls. I've just heard, she says. Oh God, Robert. I say nothing. She asks when and I tell her a week ago. God. Robert, I'm so sorry. I say thanks. Don't know why, given she's dumped me. Robert. Everyone else, parents included, calls me Rob, except Spence. He calls me Robbo. Ali asks after Dell. I throw caution to the wind and tell her he's out buying tongue of dog and adder's fork, then hang up and reward myself with what's left in the bottle. Go to Spence's room. Typical of him to take the smallest room, even though he owns the flat. I lean against the doorframe, looking in on the brick and plywood bookshelves against the right wall, the clothes rail taking up most of the left, the single made bed sandwiched in between. November smudges the pane, rattling in its sash. I'm in the cabin of a rickety ship at the end of the world. I raise my glass to I don't know what, glug most of it down, then head back to the kitchen. Fill the kettle ready for the stock. In all the time we've shared this flat, Spence, Dull and me, dirty chicken and rice has been the house dish. It's always cooked on a Monday as a way of overcoming the day's horrors, and always cooked by either Dell or me. Spence can't make toast, let alone a pilaf, for that's what dirty chicken and rice is, a pilaf. I came across the original recipe in one of the posh Sundays, the one that Dell doesn't review for. It was by the cookery writer Rex Gayford. Dell and I were wasting an afternoon in the Shakespeare. He's an arse, Dell said, tossing the paper back at me. I met him at a book launch once. I told him then he was an arse. Or, uh, or allegedly I did. Which explains why he doesn't, can't, submit reviews for that particular paper. It was in a mood of booze fueled spite that, staggering home from the pub, Dell decided to make the dish to prove just what an arse Gayford was. But despite, or maybe because of, the alcohol, it was an unexpected triumph. Dell tore out the recipe, took a felt pen to the writer's name, and scrawled his own above it. Gayford's chicken pilaf became Dell's chicken pilaf, the success of it, the very idea of it, down purely to Dell. Let's do to that chicken pilaf what I'd like to do to Gayford, Dell announced one evening, a Monday. Ruffle its feathers. Gayford was everywhere at the time, with a new book out and a TV show to pimp it. Both Dell and I were a little jealous. Dell because every publisher was rejecting his novel, me because I was getting next to no telework and fuck all else. Spence didn't improve matters by mentioning that Gayford had once shopped in his bookstore. He was nice, he said. Cute, too. Nice, Dell scoffed. That does it. So Dell and I set to work on roughing up the pilaf. I scattered over chopped garlic from an entire bulb, and Dell threw in a fistful of chilli flakes. 
the blackened onions and the chicken skin that looked more brown than golden added to the grubby effect of the dish. What have you done to it? Spence asked when he came through to the kitchen. He inspected the mound of spice-sticky rice leavened with semi-burnt chicken piled into a Pyrex dish, tide-marked and nicotine yellow. He dug in the fork Dud had handed him. Tastes heavenly. Only, my darling boys, it looked like a pile of absolute filth. Needs cleansing. Coriander. We found some out-of-date coriander leaves from the bottom of the fridge and mixed them through. Then Spence rechristened what our house speciality has been called ever since. Dell's keys in the lock so I untucked the grease-scarred cutting from the fridge door, as well as the chicken, a bunch of coriander and yoghurt. Dell's bought a box of wine, plus Alka-Seltzer. Breakfast, he says, tossing the packet onto the kitchen table. Ali rang. Invite her over. Thought you didn't like her. Spence did, he says, grappling with the tap on the wine box. You did. Do. Wine spurts into his glass and he gulps down a mouthful. Pulls a face like a kid force-fed cough syrup. I tell him about the cabin and the rickety ship and the world's end. Mistake. It's a box room in an archway flat. Get a grip. He heaves out Spence's barely used La Cruze from a bottom cupboard onto one of the work surfaces. Not the Pyrex. I thought the La Cruze would lend a little dignity to proceedings, Dell says. He pulls open other cupboards, taking from them the staples for what was Gayford's, but which is now definitely ours. Oil, spices, seasoning, and from the fridge, butter. I leave him to it. Do you want to come over for dirty chicken and rice? I ask Ali when she picks up. Only you and Dell could pay tribute to Spence with dodgy cooking, she says. Dell's invitation, not mine. But you're the one that's phoning. When she arrives, I make her a peppermint tea in Spence's mug. A large, deep blue mug she's always coveted. Dell has taken over the kitchen, cooking the chicken in batches, taking his time. The radio's howling out psycho Billy. The small table in the middle of the room is a blitz of unpacked shopping, and there's a crime novel propped open against the wine box. The deadline for his review is midnight. It's now eight. Are you going to get it done? I ask him as I mash the sodden green triangle with the back of a spoon. Yeah, yeah, he says, confettiing chilli flakes over the dung-coloured thighs. It's the same as all his other boringly predictable books, only this one's set in Amsterdam so he can show off his drug knowledge and sound cool. His face is blotchy pink from the walk up the hill after his shopping trip and from the booze. His Smith's t-shirt doesn't quite manage to cover his rind white paunch. Does he sound cool? No, he sounds like a wanker. Who done it? I ask. Art dealer guy. I intend to reveal this small detail in my opening sentence. Stock? I find a suitable jug and pour in what's left from the kettle. Add a couple of ready-made cubes and watch them sink to the bottom. Pick up the jug and rotate it gently to help the stock dissolve. Dell removes the last of the thighs from the pan and starts to add slices of onion. Don't forget to introduce the garlic, I say. Onion, garlic. Garlic, this is onion. Neither of us smile. It's an old joke that isn't funny anymore, but one of us still says it when we make dirty chicken and rice. It's part of the ritual. Ali is sitting on the edge of Spence's bed, eyeing her way along the bookshelves. The volumes are mainly in hardcover, first editions of books by writers Spence admires. Alphabetical order, of course. Cheever, Hollinghurst, Tart, Waters all carefully cellophaned to protect the dust jackets. They look almost mummified, she says. Oh, Christ. She turns away. I stand there with mug and glass like a waiter. She'll reach out a hand if she wants me, only she won't. I watch her shoulders heave. How goes it? She asks me eventually, reaching out for her tea. How do you think? I don't mean about Spence. I mean work. 
by which I mean acting, not bloody temping. Well, there's not much around of either. She looks at me over the rim of the mug that she's held up to her lips and informs me I'm hopeless. She sips, swallows in a way that is more noisy than necessary. It's one of the few things about Ali I never liked. Not that she knows this. Would gulp even more noisily if she did. I mean, you're talented, she says, but you're a rubbish self-promoter, not like Spence. You were always a little in love with Spence. So were you. So was Dell. Who didn't love Spence? You know, you should take a leaf out of Spence's book. You and Dell. Look where it got him, I say. Running his own bookshop. Getting murdered in a toilet. Someone didn't love Spence. She glares at me. I deserve whatever's coming. She lets me have it between the eyes. Failing as an actor. Sorry, I mutter. The only light is the one trickling through the hall from the living room. She takes another swig of tea. Gulp. I'm enough in shadow that she can't see me wince. Dell's sudden clattering and the radio blare fill the silence between us. I want to close the door and plunge us into darkness. I want to collapse next to her on Spence's bed and push my face into the shiny straightness of her hair. Instead, I ask, how goes it with you? She shrugs. When I think she's not going to answer, she starts telling me about the next production at the theatre she markets for. Sam's directing it. She says this in a voice that tells me I'm still being punished for what I said about Spence. Sam, Sam Kemp, is who Ali has dumped me for. I bury my nose in my glass and drain what's left. I was supposed to be seeing him this evening, she adds. Lucky me, I say, then wave my empty glass at her. In the kitchen, Dell is using a potato masher to submerge the pieces of chicken into the spice-gritted, stock-soaked rice. The tide's out in his glass too, so I do the honours. Then I pour out a glass for Ali, her prize for standing Sam Kemp up. Open sesame, Dell says, lifting the handles of the Le Creuset with an old tea towel. He swears as the heat hits his fingertips through the thin material. I yank at the oven door and watch the nth attempt at dirty chicken and rice disappear in. Dell whips the towel over the back of a chair and wraps both hands around his glass to cool them. I set about making the dressing. Yoghurt, lime juice, mint. Salt, Dell orders, watching me prepare it. Easy. He looks alarmed at the amount of salt I'm adding to the yoghurt mix and tells me to add more lime. Well, there isn't any more. Well, lemon, then, he grunts. I don't know what's worse, being in here with someone who hates nearly everything he reviews or being in a dead man's shoebox with my tea gulping X. Half an hour till the food's ready. I opt for the X. She sparked up a tea light and planted it on the windowsill. Spence used to place tea lights about the living room on dirty chicken and rice nights. Equipped with a plateful and glass of wine... We'd settle into our chairs, things immediately less shit, as we scoffed and guzzled and shared the shit of our shitty Mondays. The rude customer, the rejection slip, the cattle market of an audition, all vanquished amid the tiny, flickering flames and the steaming, spiced grains. If Ali was with us, she'd pretend her Monday had been shit as well. I'm sorry too. Ali says now. You're not a failure. Not yet. She takes the glasses of wine from me and puts them on what passes for Spence's bedside table. A neat stack of porn mags. She hugs me. I sort of hug her back, not daring to hug her more than I want to. Then do, more holding on than hugging. She pulls away as though not wanting to be caught at something no longer permitted. She grabs her wine, sits back on the bed. I sit next to her. This okay? What? Me sitting here next to you? Idiot, she says gently. I reach for my glass. Do you want anything? 
I ask her. I mean, before it's all cleared away. What about a collection of specialist interest magazines, one careful owner? Idiot, she says again, not so gently. As we drink, we turn our heads to watch the flame of the tea light shivering in the draught. Our reflections peer in at us like ghost children. Later we hear Dell stumbling down the hall. He's carrying a tray with three steaming bowls and the yoghurt dressing in an old jam jar. The box of wine is stuffed awkwardly under his arm. I've never been able to work out, Ali says, as Dell sets tray and box on the floor. Which part of this dish is supposed to be the dirty part? Dell and I exchange looks. Is it the chicken? Or the rice? Or both? Both, Dell and I say in unison. But the rice looks dirtier than the chicken, Ali says. Dell points out that the chicken, fried and basted in oil and butter, practically OD'd on chilli, is pretty goddamn dirty. I like the coriander. Ali says, staring down at her bowl. Makes it look healthier than it is. That was Spence's idea, Dell says. His voice is shaky. He sits cross-legged on the floor. In his too small t-shirt, he looks about nine years old. The tea light makes a throaty rattle. We watch it gurgle and spit. How much longer, Spence, can we eke it out, this half-life we're leading? How long before we grow up? We do the only thing possible. We tuck in. That was Simon Roberts, reading from his story Dirty Chicken and Rice. If you've been enjoying my stories on the podcast, you might be interested in a promotion I'm running for Halloween. A book of short stories by Tabitha Potts will be available at half price at amazon.co.uk and amazon.com. Thank you and goodbye.